Hi, brothers and sisters. I just wanted to come on and share with you the, everything that God is speaking to me about uh, since Rosh Hashanah has passed, came and went, and that we are still here. Uh, praise the Lord, because God uh, continues to teach us. Uh, you know, we do not know everything. Uh, oftentimes we uh, think we do, and we don't. God is continuing, continually uh, um, uh, revealing things through His Word, illuminating our minds. You know, when Dan when He came, the angel came to Daniel. Daniel Daniel wanted to know so much more about the future, but the angel told him that he needed to seal up the books till the time of the end. So many things have been sealed, uh, and many mysteries that we didn't uh, know. <laughs> you know, years ago are coming to uh, illuminate our eyes now. So we're on this continual process of learning. And for the past year, God has really had me dig into these feast days. And I'm still learning a lot about uh, God's divine appointments, which I believe still firmly need to all be prophetically fulfilled. How that all fits into God's time and his plan and his purpose. You know what he's showing me? We just don't know. We can try to sit and figure it out. And we can try to, to uh, you know, um, um, look at a specific feast and say, well, he's coming on this because this parallels this. And, and uh, we just don't know. The Lord is true when he says, no man knows the day or the hour. And Rosh Hashanah, that term comes from that. But I truly believe that the Lord wants to surprise his bride, not in a sense that he wants to catch us off guard or because he says, those that are watching this day isn't going to overtake us as a thief. But you know what? When you go out and you buy somebody a gift for their birthday uh, to give to them or just a gift because you care about them, you're excited to give it to them. And when you give it to them, they don't know what's inside. They're hoping, they're expecting, they're excited, but they don't know what's in there. They, they, you're giving it to them unexpectedly. They might not have known you were going to get them a gift. Uh, so, you know, the Lord, I believe he's just as excited as we are, but he has to wait for his father to say, son, go get your children. You have to look at the Jewish wedding. You have to look at the parable of the 10, 10 virgins, you know, in, every, in both of those cases, the father had to release the son to go get his bride. And they come and she he came to snatch her at a time that she did not know. She came at the midnight hour. But while she was waiting, guess what she was doing? She was excited. She was preparing herself. She was adorning herself. She knew she was coming. She he was coming. She had that hope hope. And so she spent time prepared, but she didn't know when he was coming. She knew about the time he was coming, but she didn't know she didn't know when. And you know what? We're the bride of Christ, and we know that we're in the season. We see the signs um, before us like never before. We, this earth has been in birth pains and in travail and, and, and groaning for some time now, and never before in history has all of the signs come at us at such an accelerated speed. And so you know, as the as a woman is pregnant for nine months, we know that she's pregnant. We see all the signs. We see her, her tiredness. And you, as a woman, you feel tired and you, you have all the symptoms of sometimes you get nauseous and you throw up and you crave, uh, you know, certain foods that you normally wouldn't crave. And, and then you, then you, you know, your belly starts to show and then you start to feel the kicks and then you, you know, it, and then at the final trimester is when everything kicks into full gear and accelerates and you get the contractions harder and faster and stronger. And then soon, suddenly, the baby is delivered onto the world scene. Well, that's where we're at right now prophetically. We are at the end of pregnancy. We're in the final stages of pregnancy. This earth is groaning and moaning and in travail and in birth pains. And the contractions are getting harder and faster and stronger and all culminating together. That is how we know we're about to deliver the Messiah on the scene and he's going to take his bride and he's going to take us to heaven and soon the seven-year tribulation will be poured out so you know what when Rosh Hashanah, I just want to take you to where God has had me the since Rosh Hashanah you know we were all looking to that day we were all hoping for that day we were all excited for that day today but to be honest with you when that day finally came Seven minutes before the, the 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 last trump was blown on Rosh Hashanah, I um, I uh, the Lord spoke to me, and you know for those two days period, 
Uh, I never told anybody this, but there was something inside of me that just kept saying, not now, not now, not now. And I, did, I, I even though I was hoping and, ex and expecting and hoping it, for, well, hoping it would happen, there was just another part of me that was saying it's not the time yet. And, uh, and so something was just not excited inside of me. Uh, and those two days, Satan came at me with horrible, horrible attacks. And I was very discouraged. And, um, and my eyes got focused upon the circumstances and not upon uh, the Lord and staying in the ark and being still. So I want to share with you, starting at Rosh Hashanah, uh, what happened in my spirit seven minutes before that, that last trump was blown. And um, I've, I've been writing a lot of things down. I've got about three pages here of everything the Lord has been showing me the past two to three days since Rosh Hashanah. But when Rosh Hashanah, that Trump is about to blow, something in my spirit said what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. I know I've always said that I felt that sudden destruction and the rapture would happen at the same time. And World War III and what is taking place over in the Middle East is God's timepiece. God told me, if you want to look for a sign, look to Israel. They are the centerpiece for your home going. Mm -hmm. There is so much taking place over there. I won't get into all that. But, you know, many are having dreams and visions of nuclear attacks and bombs and, and uh, just Israel, Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17 coming into fulfillment. We're seeing all of that. So God took my mind back to Israel and how they are the center timepiece. And that's where our eyes need to be. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we can, you know, go back and ask ourselves, you know, questions of, of, oh, well, you know, well, God showed me this about Rosh Hashanah. God showed me that. Sometimes we don't understand everything and we won't understand everything until we get to heaven. But everything happens for a purpose and a plan. And God, uh, you have to just be obedient to what God shared, is telling you to do at that moment. And so um, we don't maybe understand all the wherefores, but God has given me Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 last year. And I still have this verse on my desk. And it says, don't dwell on the past. Do not look to the former things. Look ahead to the future. For I am doing a new thing. Do not perceive it. It's, it, it springs up now. I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. So we can't go back to the past. The past is past. We must look forward to the future. And I want to tell you what God is showing me about the future. Um, you know, I, God is telling me that he wants us to continue to wait Waiting is a good thing. We're not used to waiting in our society. We are a very impatient people. And if God wants us to be bearing fruit. His bride needs to be bearing patience. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Jesus says in Isaiah 40, 31, that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary, and they shall walk and not faint. He took me to Isaiah 43, 15 through 19. And he says, I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth a chariot and horse and the army and the power and the army uh, and the power. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God is in control of all things. His timing is perfect. And while we think we might have it figured out, we really don't. He has a perfect set time when his father is going to say, son, go get your children. And everything in his word must come into fulfillment. So the Lord is 
telling us to wait upon the Lord. And I believe that there has been a delay, and for several reasons, uh, because God wants us to de- His bride to develop more fruit, the fruit of patience and waiting. When we wait upon the Lord, He renews our strength. We, he wants us to have that hope, that expectation, that surprise. Um, he's also continuing to separate wheat from tare. He, our faith is being tested. It's being put through the fire. It's being refined like gold, so that He can mold us into His image. He wants to find out who's going to be faithful and stay in the race to the very end? Who's going to endure? Who's going to persevere? Because because those that have endured and persevered to the end have stood firm will be the ones that be, sa- be saved. So are you enduring? Are you waiting? Are you having patience? Are you going to stay in this race till you cross over the finish line and hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant? Or are you just in this race because you're looking to a specific day and you're repenting because you think that's going to be the day? And so the Lord wants us to be ready every day. And I also believe there's a delay in not only in waiting and developing fruit and this continued separation of wheat and tare and the testing of our faith, but God gave me a word about getting into the ark. And he wants his bride to be getting to the ark. There's still more of his bride that he's waiting for. You see, we think we're waiting on God or we're waiting on our King Jesus to come. He's waiting on his bride. All of heaven is ready. It's prepared. He's waiting on his bride to get into the ark and to be obedient and to be still and know that he is God and to focus only upon him, not on a specific day, not on a specific feast day. Not that these days aren't important to study. I believe that they are. I believe that they are God's divine appointments. I believe that they're, you know, the, that God uh, could come on one of these days. You know, the, the spring feasts have been fulfilled in perfect order, and the rest have to be fulfilled in perfect order. How that all fits together, I don't know. I do not know. All I know is that God is telling me, My bride, get in the ark, be still, focus on me, focus upon keeping your garments spotless and your lamps full of oil. So we need to find out that balance. It's not, I'm not saying that it's wrong to study the feast days. I think the Jewish, I mean, the Gentile world needs to know more about God's divine appointments. But God is specifically telling me to stop trying to figure it out because you're spending so much time and you're building up hope and expectation for something that you that that, that's going to this that could possibly not come to pass. And and uh, and then you you start the cycle all over again. You know, many people are writing me now about the Feast of Tabernacles and how that could be a possible a rapture date on October the 7th. And while it very well could be, many people are going to get their hopes up again. And instead of focusing upon being still and being the dark, see, when you're focusing on trying to figure it all out, I know for me, it becomes stressful, it becomes tired and wearisome when you're trying to study and figure, figure God out. We are not ever going going to figure God out. He ha- he he just wants us to rest, to be still, to sit at his feet, to worship him, to be in his word, to stay in his uh, to stay in his truth, not to follow the ways of man and to keep our lamps full of oil, which is the Holy Spirit. Get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Allow him to fill you up because without the Holy Spirit, you can't do anything. You don't have power. So, right now I believe God is saying, wait develop fruit. I'm still separating wheat from tear. I'm testing your faith. Are you going to endure to the end? Because I said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in you? Will he find faith in me when he, when the bridegroom returns? He's telling us, this is the season of my return. Yes, it's time to get in the ark. He told Noah seven days before um, the, the flood came. He said in Genesis 7, get your family on the boat, on the ark, for in seven days, I am going to send a flood for 40 days and for 40 nights. I believe we're in the season where God is saying, bride, it's time to get on the ark. But when you're on the ark and you're surrounded by the ark's walls, when you're in Jesus, when you make him your shelter, he is the ark. When you're surrounded by Jesus, when you're focusing only upon him, you don't see what's going on in the outside world and the chaos and the and the things that the devil wants to bring at you. You're not focusing on horizontal. You're focusing on vertical. And we need to keep our lamps full of oil. So we need to be seeking him in this hour. We need to be, this is a season of repentance. We need to be on our faces, repenting, getting out the dirt and the grime so that he is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle, who is pure and holy, who he's going to, who he's refining and molding into his image, who he's developing fruit in right now. 
So this is a season of repentance. It's a season of refining. It's a season of waiting upon the Lord and allowing him to renew your strength, allowing him to knowing that he's in control, that he has all the times and seasons in the palm of his hand. And there's nothing that we need to try to figure out or worry about. Am I saying that the rapture won't happen on uh, the Feast of Tabernacles? No, I'm not saying that. It's a very high possibility. And there's nothing wrong with studying that, but we need to have a balance. And I believe God is waiting on his bride right now. He's waiting on us to get our garments clean and ironed out and, and get, get ready for the wedding and to get covered and stay under the power of his blood and anointing, uh, anointing power of the Holy Spirit, covering yourself in the blood, which is, which is the, the blood that's going to make you worthy to escape those things that are coming to pass. You know, when I'm speaking about the delay, the bridegroom was delayed in the parable of the ten virgins. He's also was, uh, the angel Gabriel was delayed in getting Daniel an answer to his prayer uh, and to battle because he was battling the prince of Persia for 21 days. There is a war taking place that we can't see, but we can feel. Michael, the archangel, needs our prayers. The battle is intense, and, is, and it, it very well could be that our bridegroom has been delayed due to this fight. We also cannot fathom his grace and his mercy, that he wants no one to perish. We cannot always see what is happening with souls. How many more are coming in and lives being changed? I also believe our faith is being tested and tried and put through the fire as wheat is continuing to be separated from the terror. Who will be found faithful when he returns? I believe the day, uh, I believe the delay was for the bride of Christ. We need to get in the ark. We need to be focused more on him. We need to be getting any last minute wrinkles out of our wedding gowns. We need to, we are in the season of repentance. He's coming for a pure bride without blemish, one who is spirit filled and living holy, operating in power and covered under the blood. A righteous, holy bride, spiritually adorned with the fruit of the spirit. We are waiting on him. We are, we are not waiting on him. He's waiting on us. So um, I just believe that God wants us to get in the ark and be still right now. Um, like I said before, the Lord um, um, uh, has been having many people write me on the Feast of Tabernacles and the possible uh, frank time frame of the rapture of the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, I believe while anything is possible, the Lord wants me and wants his bride to stop trying to figure it out. And he's clearly showed me in his word this morning that God is in control and there is a perfect set time when the rapture of the bride will happen. And I believe it's very, 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 very soon. And um, I want to take you to where he took me to this morning. And I randomly flipped here. I wasn't planning on going here. I was just praying and asking the Lord to please reveal himself to me as I always do. And this has been happening a lot to me lately. And I just randomly opened the Bible and it fell on John 6, part of John 6 and part of John 7. You know, many of us are having mockers and persecutors come to us and and and, and, and accuse us and, um, and mock us and... and um, basically scoffers in the last days the bible said what happened would come and say where is the promise of your coming you you know it didn't come when you said it was going to happen uh you know th there's no such thing as a rapture what are you talking about your jesus isn't coming these are this is satan is working through these people to sow seeds of discouragement seeds of doubt seeds of depression to get your mind off of the truth and on to a lie and so god reminded me that jesus himself before he was crucified was mocked, persecuted, dealt with religious people, people that wanted to corner him, people that wanted to crucify him and kill him. So he knows exactly what we're going to go through. And he says that we will be persecuted for his name's sake, that we're accounted all joy. So instead of being discouraged, we need to say, yes, continue to bring on the stones, mockers, scoffers, because that means I'm doing something right for the kingdom. Satan's angry at, at you and he's angry at me because we are going forth and sharing the truth and he hates that. So he's bringing these people to try to get us off track. So Jesus was, uh, he, he, he was talking to me. Um, I, I opened this, the John ch uh, chapter six, as I have been rejected and mocked and persecuted and, and uh, spat upon. Um, Jesus showed me the heading and it says rejection by many followers. So G I just want to read a little bit to you here uh, where Jesus says, it is a spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. 
But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that would not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, have you have said to you, Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless he has been granted to him by the Father. Jesus knows from the beginning of time who is going to accept him, who's going to mock him, who's going to, you know, that's just God. He knows everything. He knows our every thought. He knows every hair on our head. He created us in our mother's womb. He knows everything about us. And he even says here, Jesus knew from the beginning who was going not, who's not going to believe. Still, he gives me a choice, I believe, though. So, um, Jesus goes on in, in, in chapter 7, and he talks about Christ's brothers. Uh, Christ's own brothers didn't even believe. And I thought that this was amazing, and I want to point this out about the Feast of Tabernacles. And, you know, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not at all saying that the Lord is going to come on the Feast of Tabernacles, but it, it just was ironic to me that people have been writing to me about this possible rapture date or this possible rapture time frame during the Feast of Tabernacles. And I open up and uh, John chapter 7 says, John chapter 7, verse 2. Now, G now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. This was a time that Jesus was being mocked and persecuted. He was going around preaching the gospel. The Pharisees hated him. They were trying to lay their hands on him to try to, you know, get rid of him. And uh, so, it, but I just found that ironic. It says, now the Jews, this was a time of all this happening. It was the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brothers were, were before him and said to him, depart from here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret uh, while he himself seeks to be no, known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe him. They always wanted a sign. You know, they, they couldn't just believe in faith. They wanted a sign. Then Jesus said to, said to them, key verse, John 7, 6, Jesus said, my time has not come yet, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast, speaking of the Feast of Tabernacles, he's talking about them getting ready to go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, for my time is not fully come. You know, Jesus, sp Jesus spoke to me there, and he was saying that there is a perfect time when all things will be fulfilled. You know, as we go on in this chapter, we'll see that the Sadducees and the Pharisees and, and, and the religious people wanted to just kill him right then. But God would not allow them to put their hands on him because there was more that needed to be fulfilled. Because everything had to happen in perfect order and perfect time before Jesus went to the cross. And going on, it says, but when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up to the feast, but not openly. It was done in secret. Then the Jews sought, sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. He said, some said, he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. So Jesus had scoffers. There were some that loved him, some that thought he was God, and, and some that just thought he was a prophet and scoffed him and thought he was blaspheming God. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied them? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but it, he, it is, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak in my own authority. The Bible says, By their fruits you will know them. God, Jesus had had a goal, a mission. He knew he was sent by the Father for a purpose, and that was to die on the cross. And he wasn't going to let anything deter him. He wasn't going to let his scoffers and people that come at him. He wasn't going to let unbelievers come at him and detour him off his mission. He knew by whom he was sent and why he was sent. And he was going to finish his race till he crossed the finish line. He who speaks from himself speaks in his own glory, but he who speaks of the glory of the one who sent him is true. You'll know who's true and who's false because the Bible says by their fruit, you will know them. 
they will speak what is from the Father, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you still seek to kill me? You know, Jesus did nothing but sh share love and heal people. He wanted people to come to salvation because he knew the truth that would set them free. Yet they hated him for it. They mocked him. They wanted to kill him. But Jesus kept pressing on, pressing in into his mission. He still loved people. And he still was sent to die for them. You know, the Holy Spirit is the only one that gives us power to do greater works. You know, without his authority, without him operating through me, I cannot do this ministry. Do you think it's easy for me to come on here and say some of the things that I do and go against the grain sometimes? Uh, you know, if you would see me off camera, sometimes I can, you know, I deal with a lot of the spirit of fear, the spirit of man. I've been rejected so many times, but God has taken me through that to make me strong for a purpose because he knew I was going to have, this was going to be my ministry in this end time hour and I had to develop some thick skin to take some of the things that were going to come at me the people answered and said you have a demon they told Jesus he had a demon in him how many people have told you that that you're 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 I've had people tell me that I'm on drugs that uh, that I'm I'm I need to be on some psychotic medication that I need to to uh, that I'm a bad parent because I'm instilling these 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 moral values of truths into my children that I'm that I'm a terrible par parent you wouldn't believe some of the x-rated things that people throw at me that I cannot I, a lot of the stuff that you see on my channel on my channel wall I can't approve that's why I put approvals on my wall because I have so much garbage that comes in from the people of the world uh, that that I just just don't want plastered all over the wall you know and so um it, it's people even accuse jesus of having a demon so you know they're not they're still a, they're they're not coming at us they're coming at the jesus the holy spirit that is within us because it boils down to a war of for your soul satan's kingdom against god's kingdom that's what it all boils down to and so Satan is coming after the Jesus within you, and he's using people to do it. He uses other things to do it, too. He knows G Satan studies you. He knows your weaknesses. And so he, he, he pushes those buttons in you, and that's why we have to have the full armor of God on. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Anoint yourself with oil. This is oil that I use. It's olive oil. There's no power in this oil. It's symbolic. I anoint myself, my family, my animals, my houses, my cars. I go around my property, anoint myself with oil, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ upon us because we need that in this hour. We are in a war, a spiritual battle. And we don't fight flesh and blood. We fight principalities in high places. Jesus answered and said unto them, I did one work, and you all marveled. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, and, the, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. We don't need to look on the outward appearance. Jesus looks, on, man looks on the outer appearance, but God looks on the heart. He judges the heart. He knows what's in here. Man's going to accuse you and mock you and look at your outer appearance and judge you falsely for his name's sake. But God looks on the heart. He is the judge. And it's this hour that I speak to my scoffers that you can continue to mock and scoff and write nasty things. But the Lord has specifically instructed me to be silent in this hour. Because in Mark, Jesus, when he was persecuted and about ready to go to the cross, he was silent. He didn't speak a word against them because he knew that Satan, if Satan knew why he was putting Jesus on that cross, he would have never crucified the king of glory. So he had to be silent. So this is an hour we need to be in the secret place. We need to speak when he speak, tells us to speak and we need to be silent when he tells us to be silent. He goes before us. He fights our battles and it is him that will silence our enemies. Now some of them and from Jerusalem said, is it not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man came from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he comes from. Then Jesus cried out as he thought, thought in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. And I have not come by, by of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. Jesus continued to speak truth to them uh, in a spirit of love. He didn't argue or debate with them. He spoke truth. 
and but they continued to accuse him and he but he continued to speak boldly because the power of the holy spirit was upon him he knew that he 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 was with him who went before him and who sent him i have not come but to my of myself but he who sent me is true whom you do not know but i know him for i am from him and he sent me see when you spend time with the father when you're in the secret place he says, my sheep hear and know my voice. We know the truth. We have the truth because we've been with the Father. And the more time you spend with the Father, the more you're able to overcome the flesh, the more power and anointing he's going to instill upon your life, the better, stronger relationship, the more he's going to reveal to you and show you and illuminate you, your eyes to be open. And we're going to know who, who have sent us. And nothing will be able to deter us. We won't look to the right or to the left. We won't, uh, things that our scoffers throw at us won't even hinder us. Because we are shielded uh, with, with the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, and the shoes of peace. Therefore, they sought to take him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not come yet. Once again, they sought to kill him. But God did not allow them to lay a hand on him. God's in control. He's in control of, uh, of evil. There's nothing that, that, he, that he comes, he was the restrainer of evil. Your, your life is in the palm of his hand. There's nothing that comes before him that Satan cannot do anything to you unless, unless God allows it for a purpose, for your good. And there's a perfect time when all will be fulfilled. Just as it was a perfect time and things had to be fulfilled for Jesus to be hung on the cross, for them, for God to finally allow them to take his son and to crucify him on the cross. But up until that time that things were fulfilled, that he was, they, nobody was allowed to lay their hand on them, all, even though they wanted to. Because Jesus said his hour had not come yet. God is sovereign. He alone sets the time. As, as with Jesus, so with us. No one can touch us without the Father's consent. So, um, I wanted to share with you then, I'll read a little bit to you of some things that I wrote down as I wrap this up. And what God uh, is saying in this hour, and I shared a little bit with you uh, in the beginning. Um, but, this is what God, I feel, is saying to the bride. He's telling his bride now very clearly to enter the ark and be still, constantly trying to figure out uh, uh, the, the time, the, the exact day and exact timing is, can be tiresome and stressful, and many set up hopes only for them to possibly fail and be let down. And then they go running after another time, and the cycle continues. You know, I have been guilty of that as well. This doesn't promote rest or stillness. I know one thing, he is coming and it's soon. He has commanded his bride to be still and focus upon him only in keeping our garments spotless and full of oil. While it's okay to watch, uh, to watch, I believe Satan can use what is good for evil. He can get our eyes so focused on studying a possible set time that we aren't in the secret place being still and repenting. This is the season of repentance. In Ecclesiastes, it says there is a time for everything under the sun. This is a season of lamenting and crying out, humbling ourselves, being still and knowing and allowing him to speak to us, move us to greater works, preparing his bride to be holy, pure, and spotless. Don't give the devil a foothold to getting your eyes so set on a specific time that you lose focus on what he is really you calling you to do in this hour. That is to focus upon him, focus on being still, focus on repenting of sin, cleansing yourself with the power of his blood, which will make you pure and holy, righteous and accounted worthy to escape all that is coming. If you want to watch for a sign of his coming, he told me to watch Israel. They are the centerpiece. While I'm not looking for any set time for his return any longer, because I know it will happen in his time, I randomly flip my Bible open to uh, uh, which happens a lot these days, and it landed in John 6 and 7, which I shared with you. I began to read all of Jesus, what all of Jesus went through prior to his death. He faced many things. 
that we are going through, like rejection, unbelieving people, religious people, and scoffers. Many hated him so much they tried to lay their hands on him and kill him, but they were not able. The Bible says in John 7, 6, and 30 that they couldn't take him because his time had not yet come and the hour had not yet come yet. See, God spoke to me that he is in control and has a set time for everything. His time is perfect and all will be fulfilled. He had a set time for his son to be crucified and had not yet come. So he did not allow those who wanted to kill him right then to do it uh, until all had been fulfilled. The same is true with the rapture. I did, not, I did find it interesting, though, as I started to read John 7, the verse 2, it says, Now the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, and we're coming up on that time. Interesting to note, all who are writing me about the time, and uh, as I read that today, looking in my notes in my Bible regarding this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles was one of the three great Jewish religious festivals. Passover and Pentecost were the other two. It is called the Feast of Tabernacles because of the seven days the people lived in shelters or lintos made of branches and leaves. Interesting to note here that God called Noah in the ark, which was his tabernacle or a place of shelter for seven days, seven days prior to the flood and how God is calling his bride now into the ark, which is Jesus and who is our shelter according to Psalm 91.1. The feast commemorated the days when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness and lived in tents, according to Leviticus 23, 40 through 43. The festival was uh, celebrated in September and October. As the Jewish uh, people entered their shelters, made outside their homes, and stayed there for seven days, could it be the bride would be removed to another shelter away from their earthly homes for seven years? We know it is nigh because of all the signs that are accelerating at top speed. Never before in history has that everything come together so quickly. One doesn't need to know, even know the signs to realize something huge is happening. Even the unsaved are seeing it and is wondering, and is wondering which makes it great opportunity to share the truth about Jesus. So um, if we really want to know we really, if we really know Jesus, we would know that he loves surprises. He is surprising me all the time, which, uh, in which, uh, he is surprising me all the time, which in turn lets me know it is his hand that performed leading me to praise him. He wants all the glory. I'm not talking about surprising us in the sense of catching us off guard for his word says those watching will not be overtaken, but surprising us in the fact of which day he could return. We all know we're in the season any day now, but he wants us to be ready every day. This is the season of repentance. Let's stop reading, ready, let's spend it readying ourselves and seek his face. While there is nothing wrong with studying these feast days, as I still believe they will be prophetically fulfilled and that they are God's divine appointments with mankind, we need to have a balance. I strongly believe God wants his people in the ark, being still, focusing only upon him and giving, keeping our garments spotless and ready and keeping our lamps full of extra oil, which is the Holy Spirit. It's a time of repentance, a time of worship, a time of sitting at his feet and basking in his presence. It's a time to rest, my bride. It's a time to enter the secret place of the Most High, your tabernacle, wherever that may be. So I pray that this was an encouragement to you. This is what God is specifically showing me, and I believe that he wanted me to share it with you, that those of you that are part of the Bride of Christ, that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and that are living holy unto him, that are seeking him in this hour, that are repenting of sin, and he's waiting for, for his bride to get into that ark. He, you know, uh, we don't always see what's happening behind the scenes. And although we try to figure it all out and we think we've got it pinpointed, God surprises us once again and says, be still and know that I am God, that everything will be fulfilled in his time, not our time. And so let's use this time as we wait to develop fruit. Know that God is separating his bride out and gathering it into the ark that he's testing our faith so that we can have endurance and that we can persevere to the end of the race and that we can cross over that finish line and finally hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into this kingdom that I have prepared for you. So let's just be still. Let's keep our eyes on the skies. And yes, let's keep our eyes watching the signs around us and watching and paying specific close attention to what is going on over in Israel because the seven-year tribulation is for Israel. It's when God 
turns his eyes back to his bride, Israel. So, and takes him through, yes, a horrible time of testing, but his purpose is to bring them to Jesus, their Messiah, and they will finally recognize that. So, um, anyways, I love you all, and I pray this was a blessing to you, and I pray that the Holy Spirit spoke through me to you about what he is, uh, what he is uh, wanting his bride to be doing in this hour as we wait upon the King of Kings and our Lord of Lords to break through those clouds and to soon take us home. I love you all. Have a blessed day.